All right, we are recording. Today is, today is March 26, 2017. And I have with me Star Traveler and Jim Charles. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. And um, Jim will do the interview. With, it would be, I guess, our fifth, fifth meeting with uh, Star Traveler. So we continue from here. Okay, I'm going to do some of it. I just wanted to uh, say hello to everybody. Uh, but I'm going to have uh, Max ask some questions too. He has some agendas that he wants covered as well, and that's a wonderful thing. So, but my first thing is um, a star traveler. She has her story written on her uh, site. What's the name of your site? Messages from a star traveler. <laughs> Wonderful. I just wanted to make sure everybody got the right one. And um, so her story is written there of her from her home planet, correct? And yes. what was your name there? Uh, my name there was Ileana. Wonderful, beautiful. Yeah. And my questions uh, stem from that story. Uh, you can tell a little bit about your story, but I wanted to hear a little bit about for those that don't know your story give us a fill us in a little bit about the basics of the background of where you are from okay i'm from a planet called Kanatra, and it's a uh, it's located in the known universe like on the border of the known universe in this saiga star system that's what i had put on my website um, and actually, our known universe and the unknown universe, there's a border between those two, and that's where this planet is located, the Kanatra. It's a fiery planet. It's very hot there. Um, they do a lot of magic, actually, with fire and the elements, because they have magic users on that planet with abilities, psionic abilities, fire, water, air, they can change the elements on planetary bodies. That planet is a seventh dimensional level. And that's where my soul came from originally. That's where I was born trillions of years ago. That's where I, my, my whole soul essence came from. Very good. Can you describe a little bit what seventh dimension would be like? Seventh dimension is where you have all of your psychic abilities at hand. You're not sick. There's no disease on that planet. And I had wings. I had fire, what looks like fiery wings, elemental wings, so I could fly on that planet and that seventh dimensional body. That sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is now, what made you want to come? come to earth or what is it that brought you here that happened in another lifetime separate ah. from kanatra my origins are from kanatra and on on that level i had access to all the akashic records and how all universes are created on kanatra from from that level of some dimensional being but the reason why i came to earth has has associations to do with my Andromedan Pleiadian hybrid body that that was the last lifetime that I had. It was almost an immortal. Um, two, two million years ago, my soul, one of my soulmates, um, her name is Akira. She is Andromedan. She, she wanted to help Earth ascend during the um, Atlantis timeline which was 2 million years ago on that timeline. She wanted to help the earthlings and some of the ATs in Atlantis to ascend, but they did not want to listen to her. And she was trapped by the Matri and the Greys in the Amaramuru uh, tunnel system, Stargate tunnel system under the earth in Peru. So I came back in this human body. I gave up my Andromedan Pleiadian hybrid body in incarnated in a human body to help her to release her from from the entrapment of the stasis she was put in permanent stasis in the stargate tunnel system amaramuro portal which looks like a huge door carved in a mountain with a carved keyhole 
but you'd put a key in, in Peru near Lake Titicaca just for a reference. It's a physical reference point that's actually here on the planet called Amaramuru. And they have that Stargate portal under Amaramuru. That's where she was trapped by the Matri and the Greys. Wow. Is she still there? No, she's been um, she's been taken off planet by the Andromedans, the people that are, some of the people that I know from the Andromedan Red yeah. Arrow Squad. So she's been rescued. But I had to be reincarnated in a human body to help her. I couldn't come here in my Andromedan Pleiadian hybrid body because this planet has its own rules and laws of how, of how we function. Exactly. That's another thing I wanted to talk to you about. Having come into a human body, what were the challenges you had to face? Um, my frequencies are not calibrated to be in this human body, especially now. Um, it was never calibrated correctly. I always felt like th this planet was a heavy density for me, like I didn't belong here. It was always like that since I was a child. So uh, I would always connect to higher dimensions, to my ET friends. Uh, I would say I'm not grounded to this planet correctly, I'm not connected energetically correctly to the planet. Okay. So there's a major disconnect with third dimension in many ways. Yes, there's a very huge disconnect. I would um, say my, my human side is not in sync with my ET side because there's two sides to me. There's the ET side and there's the human incarnated side and it's not, it, it, it's not balanced. Okay. How did this affect your actual life on the planet? My health, I would say the most. My health, my neurological health is not, my autoimmune system is not calibrated to my body. So I've always had issues with health. Like I'll, 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 I'll attune something and recalibrate something and ground something in my body. Then something else will come up because the energies, uh, this body is too small for the um, ET energy that lives within it. The ET part of my soul that's in here. It's too small for that. Okay. How is your ET side hand? Handling all this. I know that you have been traveling to other places for a good while and um, doing a lot of missions outside of the third dimension. So how is your uh, ET body handling the Earth experience? It's not handling it well. It wants off this planet. The ET side of me wants off this planet. For is it, oh, I was going to ask, is it painful? Yes, it's often painful when the ET side of me has to come back to the human body and reintegrate with it. It's often there's pain, especially like joint pain in the legs. It's like if you've been out in space too long and you come back, um, your eyesight is different, you, your muscle joints are different because the gravity vibration energetically, you come back. It's the same thing with the ET side of me that when it comes back into this human body, and reintegrates with the human part of the soul because I, 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 it's almost like I have two different souls living in this body right now. So it's not how, easy how to reintegrate. Does, yeah, how long does it take to reintegrate into the body or does it never really fully do that? It never fully does it anymore. Never I understand. It. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm, I talk to other people that have alien connections that have also a disconnect from third dimension, but yours seems to be a lot more severe and a lot more painful. Um, is there anything that gives you relief on this planet from, from this particular ailment? Yes, being out in nature, eating organic food, not being under bright lighting like fluorescence, LEDs, my body seems to be seeking natural, natural things like nature, um, good food, good water sources, good lighting, you know, like more natural type of lighting. So environments, uh, fitting in into different environments doesn't seem to be easy. Like I, I, where I live in Canada is very clean air. So my, my living environment has to be correct for my body to be able to function. Otherwise it just disconnects. 
Okay. Um, you came from a very warm planet eventually a long time ago. But so living in Canada, it's very cold. Does that affect your health at all? Um, yes. In the winter, I have a lot of joint pain. So it, it, energetically, I prefer, I don't prefer hot or too cold. I prefer like a nice medium. So oh, excellent. I would like it to be eternal summer if possible, like a moderate 23 to 25 degree summer. I prefer excellent. that. Can I, um, ask, Go ahead. so you started the, the story about your friend. Uh, how did, how did she, was she liberated? Uh, the Andromeda and Red Arrow Squad, who are associated with the Andromeda Council, uh, rescued her. And she's, she's, she's my soulmate. Um, Akira is my soulmate. She's an Andromedan, full Andromedan woman who, who is 10th dimensional, actually. So, so you said you had to go to Earth to, to liberate her? Did you participate yes. in liberation? Yes, I sent out a telepathic communique to the Red Arrow Squad. They're Andromedan. It's two women and two men, and they came in a cruiser, starship cruiser, an Andromedan cruiser to get her. She actually, because she had been in stasis for far too long, two million years, she needed plasma transfusions. Not blood transfusion, but plasma transfusion. Andromedan Palladian hybrids, or even full Andromedans, if, they, if they've been in stasis too long, they often need plasma transfusions. So they brought two plasma transfusers and attached them to her arms in order to, before they could transport her to get her out of Amaramuru, they needed to transfuse her with the plasma injection through the infusers. So couldn't you send your telepathic message without incarnation on Earth? Why so much sacrifice? If, if that was done without your direct participation? Well, she wanted to go to Earth, and mm -hmm. she wanted me to go too. And I didn't want to come to Earth because I had had enough of this planet in previous mm -hmm. incarnations. I didn't want to come. But she was lost. Nobody. She went without telling anybody where she was going. Akira didn't tell me or anybody else where she was going. So what I had done is I, I searched for her. I searched mm -hmm. for her, and... I pinpointed approximate timeline on earth where she ended up, but I needed to come in person to, to find her. Oh, so you did psychic work on yes. earth by being on earth. You were able to locate her yes. from where you are from Canada. You just psychically located. Her. Yes. Yes. Um, but the thing is because of the rules of this planet, just because you love somebody, you just can't come in and get them. Oh. You, there's certain energetic um, rules and laws that this planet has, Earth Gaia has. So through vibrational, I needed to be human to, 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 to be able to come here to this planet to get, to get her. First, I needed to remember my um, ET heritage, get all my memories back, then find her again and send out the psychic um, beacon code for the other four to come and get her. How, how long did it take you after you were born onto the earth to get your psychic memories back? I got my psychic memories back when I was 28. It took me four years. Wow. I always knew as a child that I had ET connections and that I was otherworldly, so to speak. I just accepted that as part of my life, but I, I didn't have like full memories of that I was a star traveler. And I gained those back in when I was 28, and I started learning shamanic practices, Native American shamanism, uh, plant medicine, uh, Wicca magic. I did some um, soul retrievals and past life regression through the shamanism, and that's how I reintegrated the ET aspects of my soul to, to gain all the memories back. How did you know you were ready to go find her? Well, my body was dying, actually, in 2014, because I was losing a lot of blood. Um, my iron levels were down. They told me, you know, if you don't do something in 10 years, you'll die. My hormone levels were low and imbalanced. So I was told you'll have a heart attack and you won't be able to walk in 10 years. 
Wow, that must have been sort of devastating. But you knew yeah. that your uh, future was going to be successful. I did, but the, the thing is, future outcomes can change. So I had, True. yeah, I had, um, I had surgery to get my um, uterus and cervix removed to stop the blood because I was bleeding out. I was hemorrhaging out. So I had that removed and basically gave me life extension. Wow. Um, and is, is that affecting you today or is, did it make things better? It made things better on the lower chakras. The, the brain damage is still, is still there, the neurological damage. That's still there and that's another aspect of um, because I had been abducted as a child by reptilians a few reptilian groups and they changed my um they changed my nervous system they changed my autoimmune system how that functions so that's another that's a whole other story where the brain damage comes from and other lighting issues and stuff but after getting my hysterectomy in 2014 i was able to telepathically find a cure and send out the uh, beacon for the Andromeda Council, uh, the Red Arrow Squad, to come and pick up Akira to take her out of stasis, do the plasma transfusions, and take her off planet for further healing. Is she still alive today? Yes, she's very much alive. She alive. Sorry, she's a star cartographer, and she also does plant medicine. She's not on Earth anymore. They took her to a different planet. Oh, she's on Earth, did you say? She's not on Earth. They took her off Earth to, to get her healed, to get her fully healed. And so uh, she wants you now to join her off planet, I'm sure. Eventually, yes. Yeah, she does. Exactly. So what is your mission from here on out until you return to her? I really don't know. I really don't know. The primary mission was to come and get her. So I'm just here on the planet for whatever. I don't know what the mission is anymore. It's I have called, to be honest. It's called bonus play. Bonus play. <laughs> yes. I don't, I don't know what's in play for me. I'm just, you know, I do healing sometimes on myself. I, right now I've stopped being a healer for others and I do healing for myself. Well, you seem to be a bright light for the ascension as well so maybe you're holding light for this planet and in, in some ways because i know the dolphin and whale society is also doing something of a civil similar nature so i think perhaps with enlightened beings such as yourself you may be holding energy for the planet to move forward at this time i wouldn't be surprised if that's if if that's that's the new mission possibly because i do uh funnel energies in and out to different places as needed for healing stuff so it's possible i'm doing that for the planet too i believe that uh do you um create vortexes ever or um use energy uh cycles for the planet or for yourself Yes, I have reset star gateway portals and fixed vortexes and locations. I, I fixed one in Alaska, uh, one of the stargate portals, and I also fixed uh, the Ganymede stargate portal near Jupiter, the trading portal, because that was oh, yeah. infiltrated. So I reset the, the energy codes. And I also go around with crystals, and I, and I um, recalibrate vortexes near where I live in White Rock, South Surrey area. So I, I've, I've put out crystal grids and I've done rock, even rock grids from rocks. If you guys know of Native American um, sacred geometry and healing, you, you do the, um, the healing circle, the sacred circle. You set it up and it, it balances the energies of wherever you are and, the, and for the planet as well. It sets up positive vibrations. Excellent. This might be a good time to segue into some of the ancient Egypt things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I, I just discovered I know very little about ancient Egypt and I should know much more because 
I was told that I've been there and I feel, feel like I've been there. So do you have any insights on personalities and how do they translate to the modern ascension? Well, I, I had a, um, a lifetime in Egypt where I was a priest. I was a male priest. Um, and that was when they were building the Egyptian pyramids. From that memory, I remember um, having a scanner in my hand and it was just energetically hauling around rocks and putting them, stacking them up in a pyramid. That's what I remember from that lifetime. And my, the male, the male guy, the, what I was re in that incarnation was called Calypso. His name was Calypso. The d device you were talking about, was that an anti-gravity device? Yes. Yes, it was. It was a handheld scanner, this big, like, long-tubed wand. You press one of the buttons, green light comes on from it, and you just point it towards an object, even something that weighs tons, like a huge rock. And it just, as long as you keep the button pressed, that rock will follow you around anywhere. And you can just the frequency of the scanner, you could telepathically tell the scanner, put this there, put the stack this this way, and it will just stack. As long as you're holding the scanner and pro programming it telepathically, it'll do the job. So that's what I remember from that, from that Egyptian lifetime. Calypso took care of the architecture. He was kind of like an architect and a priest. Cool. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Max. Uh, are you familiar with Sekhmet? Sekhmet is one of Egyptian um, deities, I would say. Yeah, Sekhmet, Sekhmet Isis. Um, I know all the Egyptian deities and gods and goddesses. Yeah, I was just kind of brought to Sekhmet and uh, it seems to be a Liran, right? Well, I know the history of. Oh. I don't. I don't know what the star origins are. I just know the history of the gods and all goddesses of Egypt. The Blue Avians were involved in the Egyptian culture as well. Were yes, they? they were. Yes, Toth. Toth, I believe, might have been a Blue Avian because he was a bird-like being. Yeah, there were several bird-like beings there, and uh, some other. Uh, species as well yes yes they were and actually um the egyptian gods some of them that are depicted like bird like bird humanoid birds they were painted in blue on the walls of Correct. the temples in egypt and the blue paint is still there exactly. so so you have a human body and then you have a bird head and a beak so that's it's it's still there. The history is still there that the ATs were part of uh, the Egyptian culture because they were the rulers there. They were guiding yes. the people, and they were treated like gods pretty much because they knew so much more than the people. Yes, that's true. And they, um, if you if you look at some of the temples in Egypt beside the um, pyramids, it it shows depictions of helicopters, what looks like a helicopter, what looks like a huge light bulb, looks like electricity. So it's there, it's all, the history is all recorded in these hieroglyphs on the uh, Egyptian temples. It's like a have, library have, of history and knowledge. Have you been to Egypt or Peru in physical body? No, I've never been, but I've studied. I took... Um, I took earth history and I took cultural civilizations in high school and in college. And I was fascinated and obsessed with Egypt of all places. I would, I would build little pyramids from cardboard and stuff. And I would draw hieroglyphs on these pyramids and I would draw the Egyptian hieroglyphs. So because I had that Calypso lifetime, the energy connection to Egypt is huge. There's a huge fascination with that place. It's too hot for me. I would not be able to survive if I went to Egypt now. It's too hot. I don't know. Maybe in the winter. I don't know. Uh, my, <laughs> friend, my friend just went there. Uh, she's, uh, she's working with portals in many places, and she was called to go there and work there. So she did. Uh, she worked with the water there, with the mm -hmm. Nile and other 
water places? Well, what I remember from that Calypso lifetime, um, they had telescopes with rubies under one of the uh, Giza pyramids. They hid treasures there that are um, in the tunnel systems. What I remember is a telescope with rubies, red rubies in it set in facets to calibrate the telescope to see other star systems. Uh -huh. Do you yes. have any secret, uh, any new information on uh, the top of the main pyramid? Why was it removed? What is the mechanics of that? Well, the, the top of the pyramid, it had gold, it had gold triangles on it that would calibrate the whole grid system on the planets and energy out and in to, to calibrate the other sacred um, architectural structures on the planet. And it had a huge energetic grid around the planet. It, it maintained the um, energy grid system protection, you know, like around the planet. Um, if ships needed to, some ships, ET ships don't use fuel in them. They use pure energetic energy to power the ships. So the pyramids pre provided that energy. They were also used for healings inside the pyramid. You went in and just the, the, the gold triangle that was on top of the pyramid that would send in healing energy to the body and you were healed of all disease. But then those um, golden triangles were taken off the top of tops of the pyramids so somebody couldn't open the wrong star gateway portals or um, vortexes and as well those tr golden triangles they could be used as weapons they could be weaponized with crystals and you can it can become a weapon i i heard that there was crystals on the top of the pyramid as well for transporting yes and communication yeah Is yeah yeah, yeah, that was there as well, and that was all taken off the top of the pyramid. And what I, is lo located under Sphinx? I don't know. I don't know what's under the Sphinx. I know what's what's under one of the Giza pyramids, but not okay. what's under the Sphinx. Like, if all I don't right. know, I don't know. Okay, what's, what is under the Giza pyramids, if you can share? I already did. It's one oh. of the ruby telescopes. Got it. Yeah, and why the Sphinx? What is that creature? Do you know? I have no idea. Like an animal chimera, perhaps? A blend of chimera. That's yeah, I know, it, I know Atlantis did a lot of chimeras, and uh, yeah. it was sort of done in a negative way. They created it for more like creating slaves rather than from yeah. the positive uh, motivation. Well, I, I truly don't know what the Sphinx represents. I've never really studied that or looked too closely into that. I was more attracted to the structure of the, how they build the pyramids. Well, I was told that the Sphinx once had a human face or, or a animal face on it, and they changed it to one of the king's, one of the uh, pharaoh's faces eventually. Ah. That's just something that was rumored, I believe. Ah. Um, I'm writing now um, a history of humanity, a chapter on it, and uh, it is so, so little is known, and the stories kind of contradict each other. But uh, again, the, I guess the main story is about Lemurians, Atlanteans, and... Uh, and the destruction of Atlantis. And it's really hard to put the dates on that. Uh, my understanding is Lemurians didn't even live in this timeline. They were like from another timeline. They were in a different parallel Earth, I guess, more like more higher dimensional Earth. But you mentioned like 2 million years ago for Atlanteans, right? Do, do you yes. have any dates, more, more dates on, on Atlantean history? No, I don't have any concrete dates. And the two million years comes from my own memory recollection of, of what was, mm -hmm. of why Akira went. And the thing is, it was a blend of humans and it was a blend of ETs living together in Atlantis. So it wasn't purely an ET civilization that was in Atlantis. It was humans of what was created on this planet. You know, all the genetic manipulation and stuff, well, the humans that were put on this planet and the ETs off world that chose to live on the planet with the humans at that time. So it was a, 
it was a mix. Atlantis wasn't purely human or purely ET. It was a mix of both. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Different civilizations living together and in a cohesive manner for a long time. But the thing is, they were experimenting with um, what caused the downfall of Atlantis was because they did tinker with technology too much. They didn't follow the natural path of ascension, of organic ascension, ascension through the human soul, through the, through the body, you know, soul level. They did it mechanically. They, they tampered around with technology and that's part of the reason why it failed. Uh, one of the most respected sources on that is Blavatsky. Elena Blavatsky from about 120 years ago, her books on the secret doctrine. Mm-hmm. And there she talks about six human races. Uh, we are the fifth one. The fourth is Atlanteans. The third is Lemurians. And Lemurians didn't have the strong physical body. It was more like a ethereal body. Atlanteans mm-hmm. were the first to create the body. And that's why they did so much genetic experimentation because yes. they created the physical body. They yes. developed in many ways. And uh, from another source, I heard that many sources, they, they experimented with sex and they developed lots of sexual different physical options for humans. And, um, and then they basically, they were destroyed the, the earth and they destroyed themselves and we are picking up from there. So, so, It looks like the question was, and I think I have the basic answer. When did the Anunnaki work? So it looks like Anunnaki, well, go ahead. Well, the Anunnaki is not just one species of ET. The Anunnaki are many different ET species. That The Anunnaki word is misleading. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When you guys say Anunnaki, we all presume it's just one species, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. That's just just a code name, really. Mm -hmm. Anunnaki's were many different species, and they they played around a huge role in the Sumerian culture. Mm-hmm. And the Sumerians they helped shape them. So, but in Sumerian tablets, there is a lot of specific details about their traditions and Enki and Enlil. I think that his name is. And uh, yes, I remember I was surprised that they were traditionally marrying their, not the sister, but I guess the first cousins. So it was partial, uh, it's called inbreeding and genetics is called inbreeding. It causes a lot of genetic uh, mutations to, to be revealed. So it, it causes mm-hmm. uh, more sickness in the, between the children, but wh- whoever survives has the purest genetics. So yeah. the advantage of their system was that they kept the lines very pure. Bloodlines, yeah, very blood pure lines, blood very lines. Pure. So, this Enki, was he human or reptilian or both? Or do you Well, know? the Anunnaki's were humanoid type looking species. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm, but from the information that I've studied and heard, Anunnaki is, is many different humanoid species. It's mm-hmm. not one species that I know of. Right. So I guess we need some special names like Anunnaki of Enki bloodline yeah. and Anunnaki of other bloodlines. But Yeah, exactly. So we need like Anunnaki 1, 2, 3, 4. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it wasn't just one species. It was a few different humanoid species that were lumped in called Anunnaki. Uh, lately, we have lots of draconians coming from all sorts of directions to us. And... Uh, I guess I was the one who pronounced it word, by the way. Uh, no, not not first one ever pronounced, but in my circle of channelings, I just kind of was called to say now, it was, I guess it was half a year ago. Now the time the draconian energy is here. It was so vibrant in the air. I just felt it. Uh, are the Anunnaki's draconians as well? Do you know? I don't get the feeling that they're draconian really. I don't uh-huh. get that energy. I don't know personally myself, but I don't feel that they were purely draconian. What makes you feel that way? 
the energy feels wrong. It just doesn't feel draconian. I read energies of everything and anyone, and it doesn't feel draconian to me. It feels more Orion. Orion, but not draconian, not the draconian Orions. Oh, do you feel draconian energies in me? I see you have about 30% draconian. In yeah, I have some of that. I keep it yeah. under control, though. Yeah. I, like, I get... It's not can, my choice to be draconian. I don't yeah, think it's, it's 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 not really anybody's choice. You you have the 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 ET percentages that you do of your soul yes. incarnation, what your soul wanted to come in with. So it's it's I I have Andromeda and Palladian energies. That's the percentages half half of that and that. I don't have Draco in this lifetime. I have zero draconian. You see, I don't think I have any draconian at all either. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, nobody can tell me. I haven't found anyone who can tell me what uh, species I'm from. <laughs> no one's been able to tell me, or no one has told me, I should say. One of creator species. <laughs> That's I've been told that before. Yes. <laughs> have um, do you have any Catharan? Um, the Catharans, they're they they're humans, you know, from France. The 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 Cathars. Do you have any connection to that? On Not that I know of. Family history, just something. I, mostly German and English, and a little uh, Gaelic that I know of. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just, when I'm looking at you and reading your energy, I get the Cathars for some reason somewhere in your history. The Cathars. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to look that up. So trying to place the, the, the timing of the, I guess, the sequence of events. So I understand the uh, Anunnaki story with Enki came after the fall of Atlantis. And it was maybe Egyptian times or around that it's it's yes. already our civilization yeah it's they around that time recreating the human after i think the after anunnaki or oh, after sorry after atlantis the humankind degraded so much they had to like pick it up from pieces and energize again and they tried like many many times until finally we picked it up yes it felt like you know they cre would create a certain race and that race would like psh, fall yeah. apart yeah, exactly. And when you, you know, when, when everything falls apart, you lose the technological side of it, of all the technology you have, and you go back to basics from almost ground zero and start again. I wonder how people lose that memory of the technology, like that, the event that happened. Eventually, people lose the me memory of the event, what happened, because they're surviving, right? So how does that happen in history? The cycle repeats over and over again. That's my question, usually. That's yeah, like, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, Russia lost its technology, like, big way. Just after perestroika, Russia, you know, we have the technologists. I know the people. Now the old people, they are dying off. But the new ones can't pick it up because there is no structure, infrastructure to support it. So rocket builders, uh, any high tech, especially biology, they just kill the science. Mm. The new new system doesn't support much of the technology and science. It starts over. It's more like coming back to to f low grade free market, like something which Europe passed a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, you need certain infrastructure to keep the technology. Um, go ahead. So when you lose the structure, you almost have to reinvent the wheel again to, to build it up again. Absolutely. To, to get to where you need to be. David Wilcox says there is two types of telepathy and two types of ascension. One is natural and one is technological. And he says, you know, the humanity lost, lost that um, Technological ways of doing psychic work, technological ways of doing uh, telepathy and ascension. So now we do, so what he says, what we, what we do now, the meditation and um, natural psychic work, it's like he, he called it uh, uh, poor, man's, poor man's way of doing things, right? So 
Uh, otherwise, you would just put some device on your on yourself, and it would like purify you and uh, uh, bring you up to speed with uh, with all the t- telepathy and stuff. But we have to like meditate lifelong to just to, to develop it naturally. Well, I believe I believe that technology will return. Really? Yeah. And even with the technology, you have to be careful because it could be used against you. Oh, of course, yeah. I, if I was offered technology to enhance my psychic abilities, I would say no. I prefer to do it naturally because I've seen what technology could do to you. I had etheric implants that were supposed to be lovely and work properly and enhance everything, but they bled through with gold and malfunctioned and made me sick. So technology could be good or it could be bad too. It's how you use it. I guess it's it's also a factor of environment. You know, really, uh, for a long time, uh, imported technology wouldn't work in Russia, right? Because mm-hmm. the, the environment was so different. Yes. Like cars are made in, cars made elsewhere wouldn't work in a Russian freezing cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. the plastic would crack, so we had to like modify the car so they would work in the snow and go on really bad roads. That's true. Same thing with the um, telepathy technology, and, and you know, here is like so much electromagnetic pollution. I, I mm-hmm. have the device that measures; it's everywhere. The electromagnetic pollution is like from every socket, from every Wi-Fi router. There is so much. Yes, mm-hmm. there's that all is- kinds of pollution too. There's noise pollution. There's actually pollution of the earth and molecular structures of it. Mm-hmm. But there's also uh, so many different kinds. It's bacterial pollution as well from different places. And uh, we have the chemical pollution from, uh, tre- uh, what do they call it? The uh, sky. Chemtrails. chemtrails. Yeah, we have, we have chemtrails in California. Not as many as in Chicago, but still. There is like a couple of trails in the sky all the time. I think they seed in aluminum. I'm yes. now Googling aluminum poisoning and I discovered I have so much aluminum in my household, like all pans and uh, frying pans and kettles, everything is aluminum. Yes, it's, it's an amazing how much pollution there is. It's called geoengineering with the chemtrails, mm-hmm. modifying the physical weather of the planet and uh, putting nanotechnology into us through the chem- chemtrail particles. It's nanotech that you're breathing in through the air. Do you think it's uh, sophisticated or is just chemicals? It's sophisticated. It makes some people sick. So it, it has some programming to it. Oh, wow. Interesting. It's, it's, That's geo- that. it's geoengineering the planet to change the actual structure of our air what we breathe, what we drink, the water, everything. It's these, these nanoparticles get into everything. We breathe them in, animals breathe them in, it goes into the ground, into the water. So it's everywhere. I'm surprised how people, some people can eat mainstream food just fine, right? They can eat meat, milk, pizza, right? And um, me and many other of my friends, they got to a certain level where they just can't take it anymore. And I, uh, I still eat chicken, but uh, I feel how certain foods kind of keep me in high, keep me high, and certain foods bring me down. So apparently, the the whole culture of introducing wheat, like wheat in Russia, wheat was the celebrated uh, celebrated food. Uh, everybody was supposed to eat bread and love bread. And it was like Russian, classical Russian food. And apparently wheat is something which brings your vibration down. So it's easier to control you. Yes, so that's very there is true. Conspiracy of beef and f- wheat and milk diet, well, which brings you down to more mainstream type of control system. Well, I can confirm that if I we- eat, if I ever eat wheat or grain, it makes me literally sick and sends me into shock. So I can die from eating that stuff. Is that because you're from a different species? Or is it, do you think it's something that is because of your earth body? It's both. My, 
before I could eat wheat and grain when I was younger, but as my ET side, my energy started coming out more and more, my hybrid side into the human body, it can't tolerate that anymore. And my even the human body says, go natural, because you don't want to be controlled by whatever's in the weed and the grain. You don't want GMO, because weed and grain are genetically modified now with certain pesticides. There's, there's nasty stuff being sprayed on weed and grain to grow it faster, to protect it from pests. So it's not the same even Russian grain that you guys used to have. There was right. healthy weed and grain before all the pesticides, genetically modified pesticides started to be used. So if you do grow wheat or grain naturally, you know, without any chemical additives or whatever, and you have organic soil, you could theoretically get back the healthy wheat and grain without the control. But you have to get good strains of wheat and grain that are not crossbred with the chemical crap that's in it now. Have you had any incarnations in India? It's your first incarnation on Earth, right? You haven't... Oh, you have been in Egypt, right? So you I've know been about... In, I've been in Egypt, in England. I was a 12th century witch in England. <laughs> I remember my Calypso... Um, incarnation i was a um a siberian shaman at one ah. point and a samurai samurai i've had a few earth lifetimes yeah you're not crazy about earth though are you no because i remember the star traveler and the star traveler was almost immortal mm-hmm. with thousands of years even millions perhaps and it. I had all my psychic abilities. I could be invisible. I could fly. I could teleport myself from one planet to the other. I had no disease. Wow, that's fantastic. So I wasn't limited to the third, fourth density reality of this world. And I could manifest anything. Like say I wanted a healing center now. I could physically manifest what I was thinking into reality, into creation. Here it takes me a long time to manifest what you know, if it's a healthy manifestation, it takes a while to manifest, if I can even. Yes. Manifestation is difficult for many humans. Do you find it really hard to manifest on Earth, harder than ever? Yes. In this human body, I find it hard to manifest things. Um, as long as I'm working on my health and grounding myself and I'm balanced in my thoughts, like if I have positive thoughts, I can manifest more. But if I have negative thoughts or I'm not happy, it's more difficult to manifest things. I'm just being honest. Yep. Oh, well, that's the way the law of attraction works here mm-hmm. on yeah. other earth. Yes. On earth. So Exactly. So it's good to be in a good mood, in a happy place, in a grounded place with positive thoughts. Then you can manifest things easier and quicker too. Absolutely. I agree with that so much. Yeah. I've been, I've been very fortunate that I can stay in a positive frame even during some negative times. So, because manifestation is very important. Mm-hmm. Especially at this time in this day and age. Yeah, it is. And like having positive timelines manifesting that for the collective consciousness, just even one person thinking that provides a bit of positive energy to it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Did you have any other questions, Max? I have tons. I just don't know where to go. Um, I guess the most brilliant one is, did you have any more insights into human colonies? Like on this planet or other planets? Oh, uh, Hukula colonies, like the ones with Tukur. Tukur and Pentium and these two. Well, I know about Tukur human colonies. I know about Tukur's side of it and a bit of the Yael. I know that yeah. they focus on the healing and the teaching aspects. That's really important for them. And they also teach about other species, species integration and contact. Tukur is really is an expert on contact with other civilizations. So her, and she's a historian. She knows the history of this planet and even possibly how this universe was created. Right. So Takur seems to be like 
one of the founders beings like so Lirans, I feel like humans. Then there is a story from Wilcock about the Lirans found in the human life or any life civilizations on solar system, not Lirans, he said felines, feline humans mm -hmm. or feline beings, feline humanoids. And then uh, there is also somewhere the information that founders in this galaxy were the feline humans. So there is tons of stories about Philistine humans, and that Sek Sekhmet, uh, Sekhmet, Egyptian god, also is a Philistine human. So I'm wondering if uh, Takur is maybe also one of creator beings, founders. Well, energetically, Takur has the ability to change what she looks like because she could be fully Lyran with with the short cat ears and the tall height and she can modify her appearance to look more humanoid with some of the um, feline um, features on the face. Uh -huh. Cause when I met her, when I went up there on one of the colony ships, she looked very humanoid, like blonde. She had blonde hair and looked humanoid. I could tell from the eyes and the nose that she had feline features cause that was slightly feline, but she looked like a, humanoid feline, not fully Lyran. I see. When I channel her, I can see her as a fully feline with the short uh, cat hair that comes down through the face, except not on the forehead or the cheeks, but very uh, feline features, very short to the, to the uh, head kind of hair and very close to the head kind of ears and she, uh, she looks very pretty still, but she looks very feline when I channel her. Can you can you ask her, Jim? Can you ask her if she is one of the founder beings? Um, yeah, if she, do you want me to channel her? Yeah, just for, for a few minutes. I just spoke to her recently, so I thought it was impolite to discuss her without, without her being <laughs> present. Yeah. Do you mind? No, not at all. I um, go with it wherever you want. Okay, go. Uh, you can uh, talk for a second while I med do a little meditation here. So I will do some chanting. <laughs> <clears throat> Oh. Greetings, I am Takur. Ah, hi, hi Takur. Alina, yes. how are you? And hi. Max, it's good to see you again. Nice I'm, to see you again. I'm so good. I, you, Takur. I um, just thought it's impolite to discuss you so much without you being present. So. I connected a few points. So it looks like Lirans were the ones, not Lirans, feline humans were the ones who seeded the solar system. Was it Lirans? It was some Lirans and some other feline species, but there were many that seeded the earth and not just one or two, but we were helpful, yes. Uh, David Wilcox talks about the the founder species, which was the first one to come and seed the solar system with uh, intelligent life. There, are, there is many, much discussion on who is the first to be on your planet. That is not something that is common knowledge. There are many theories and legends about that. But yes, we were some of the first to be around at the beginning of your, your planet's seeding. However, to claim that we were the actual first ones, I cannot do that with a great amount of confidence. Thank you. Um, Wilcock was talking more about uh, seeding the solar system before the Earth. I think it was Maldek, maybe? Maldek, yes. And, um, and other planets in the solar system which were seeded with sentient life? 
what was seeded with sentient life your other planets planet? of solar systems of of our solar there system were, yes there were other planets in your solar system that have life and had life even before your planet had life and it was indigenous of course and there was some seeding but not as great as your planet your planet had a special place in galactic history when it comes to the seeding and how many different species were helpful in doing such. The Do you have any information about that, Alina? Um, I have a question, actually. What was the special purpose of our planet and the seeding? What was the purpose in the galactic history? To bring you to this state that you are in right now, you are perfect specimens for hybridization. Your DNA will help many species in the galaxy become healthier, more Im important, and return some of their vitality. Does but, that make sense? Yes, yes. And like you said, I do have some information. Um, Earth is like a future nexus for creating new birthing places for planets and species. In it's some like ways, that is very true i'm not sure if it's so literal as all that but it will be in that vein yes and i have a question for you to care um david wilcock and others um say that there's ancient builder race technology on earth and other planets who were the ancient builder race or races they have many names throughout the universe because they were nomadic they did, they came, they built, and they tested atmospheric pressures on different metals and different uh, chemicals. They were a group of scientific travelers testing each of the planets that they would land on for different uh, ways to use chemicals, how they would be affected by the planet atmosphere, gravity, and barometric pressures, uh, precipitations, seawaters, and many, many other things. So they were nomadic, and they traveled amongst, in the universe, and still are traveling, by the way, and they test each planet and learn more about uh, how to uh, be, uh, build greater structures and have them last in uh, many, many different scenarios. Uh, they are also branching out into chemical uh, experimentations and electronical and many different aspects of their, um, of their science have expanded since then. Of course, they're quantum, they all, always have been, but they've reached um, places in quantum science that no one has reached before because they have done so much experimentation on so many different places. They've discovered by accident many beautiful and in interesting quirks that uh, many other species have yet to learn about. Do you know which solar systems they came from? They came from um, another... Uh, we do not know exactly what the name of their original solar system was, but they came from the direction of the Andromedas. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. So, and they're um, a group of many different species. They're not just one species, right? This is correct, because there are times when they have come to some planets where they have picked up some travelers that are interested in what they are doing. They are also teachers, as well as scientists and, ex and great builders and experimenters. They, they're a, an interesting scientific community that is continually expanding. Okay, so that's the only questions I had for, for you to care. Thank you. Um, I also want, so coming back to the Wilcox story, he said that the founder of feline human race, they were huge, and then they were replaced, or there were reptilians who basically took over the, the solar system. 
And then their planet, Maldek, was destroyed. So this was reptilians who, I guess, were in a war with somebody else and their planet was destroyed. Do you have any comments on that? Reptilians are credited for destroying many planets around that era. Lyra was one of those planets that were uh, reportedly destroyed by reptilians also. There is about 14 planets that have been recorded in galactic history that the reptilians are supposedly uh, the cause of their demise. And there is proof for about six of those planets, but the rest, uh, there are some questions. Um, as we speak about reptilians and lyrans, I'm writing a chapter on origins of modern humanity, the fifth human race. So we know the names for uh, three races, uh, Lemurians are number three, Atlantis number four, we are number five, and now we are birthed in the sixth race, which is ascended humanity. Do you know anything about the first two races? Uh, I do not know what they would be named. I know what they are named in some of the galactic and in the Akashic records, but mm -hmm. it was given to the Akashic records much later and was not, I do not believe it's the original first two names. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So I would not want to get, give you some false names because even in the Akashic record, it says that these are suspect. These okay. names are suspect. Okay. So uh, we have stories about the humans originating, modern humans originating from a number of alien species. Uh, and there is a number of five species and there is a number of 22 species. Uh, which ones would be the first ones? Would be Lyrans and uh, reptilians somewhere among the first species which made humans? Reptilians were very early. Yes. Lyrans were also very early. Also, there was some very early Octorians and some very early in Syrians as well, because you have to remember, these were species that were inquisitive and scientific, but also very loving and caring. And they wanted to make sure that, the, this, that uh, things were going all right in these areas. And sometimes when checking on these planets, they were only here to be more of um, custodians in the sense that they were making sure that things were all right. They weren't here to do their portion of the seeding, but of course something from their civilization was left behind or something helped with something, uh, some thought process somewhere. And we do know that some Octorians did stay on the earth for a while because of some uh, interesting experimentation that they were doing with early earth elements. But yes, we know that there were several species that came to earth. It was a curiosity. It was a beautiful planet in many senses and a little different than a lot that are out there. Uh, may I ask a question to Kurt? Oh, go ahead. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the species that are called the Anunnaki, were they just one race of species or were they many different races? They were com a combined species, correct. There was an original species, but it was not called the Anunnaki. It was, had another name, but as they grew and evolved into a hybrid species, basically, they were uh, several different species put together. They were originally a conquering species that went about conquering different planets, but their uh, thought processes changed as time went on. And instead of conquering, they then became enslaving the planet and not conquering it and using the people on the planet or using the civilizations for their own benefit. And then they became more uh, interested in uh, cold cultural, their own cultural uh, demise because they were starting to disintegrate as a culture. And so therefore they, they were many different cultures together and were having some troubles maintaining a thought process that would uh, keep them uh, connected, if you will. 
or organized. And so therefore, when, at that time when they came to Earth, they were many different civilizations. And what is the meaning of the word Anunnaki? What is that? I do not know the exact origin of the word, but I know that it came from um, a warlike species early on. And uh, it, it, uh, the first word is something about fighting the dawn. Okay. What, what draconians are uh, part of Anunnaki? What draconian blood part of Anunnaki? Draconians were not, because the Anunnaki were more, more humanoid species. The draconians were not a draconi. They would not fit in with uh, the uh, uh, Anunnaki, because the Anunnaki uh, gathered more of a, a more humanoid type species, although there were some species within them that were not quite as humanoid as others. But basically, they were a group or a colony of humanoid type species. Um, another question I had was about uh, Egyptian deity Sekhmet. It's a human with a lion head. Is it a Lyran? There was, the Lyrans do not look like lions necessarily. My husband, Bob, looks more like uh, um, more like uh, uh, more sleek than a lion in the, in the head shape. The head shape is uh, not quite as bold as a lion. There are other uh, lion and uh, feline species in the universe and it was not exactly Lyra, no. But we were there in the Egyptian culture as well. But it was not our species that Sekhmet was a part of. He traveled very far to be part of the Egyptian culture. His, his actual name is Sikimon. And he came from beyond Alpha Centauri, several galaxies behind there. Now, of course, since, since then, the galaxies have changed quite a bit in their movement. But that is originally where he was from. Thank you very much. Um, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Oh. It was very helpful. Yes, and I have one more question to take uh, care. Uh, yes. To care. So you look very leering with um, with short ears, right, and fur. But you can also change shapes to look more humanoid when you make contact with other species, is that correct? This is true. We, it is a recent development within the last uh, 20 Earth years that we are able to change our look to appease some other species and not frighten them. And humans are one of those species that we like to appease or we like to look presentable for because we respect how they feel and they, we want to to become friendly. It's not like we are being dishonest because some of the features remain, but we do not want to overwhelm any species with our size or our features that may not be the same. And is this done holographic with holographic technology or can you alter your body's molecular structure to change your physical form organically? An excellent question. And it is more holographic than it is molecular because we do take an injection to, to cause the, the outer skin to be a little bit more malleable. However, the holographic pro, uh, projection does the rest. Mm -hmm. That's pretty awesome because yeah. when I met you, you looked more of a humanoid blonde with, with cat eyes and a, a feline nose but predominantly humanoid. And in your true form, you're very tall and leering. Exactly. This is true. I'm eight foot seven inches tall in human, uh, in American human, uh, or 16 meters as it would be in, in your system. Oh, that doesn't convert. <laughs> A 16. No, that it, doesn't convert. No, no. 60 meters is something else. Hold on a second. 16. Not nope. 60. 
It's 16, I believe. 16. Okay, 16 meters is 52 feet. 1.6 then. Oh, hold on. No, it doesn't convert. I believe it's, it's a 16 of some sort, but I am all not. Right. Okay, that's all right. So in, in, in Lear and standards, what humans would call eight feet. Yes? Yeah, yes. Okay. So you're about 20% taller than I? Yes. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all the questions I had. Um, it's, it's an honor to have you and uh, a pleasure to speak to you again. And thank you very much for answering the questions. Thank you. Take care. It is a pleasure. Thank you. I will talk to you again at some other time. Yes. Talk to you later. Yes. Hey, Jim, welcome back. Hey. You are Ooh. leaving in, uh, in about a few minutes, right? Yes, I have to get going in a few minutes. Mm. Yes, other, un unfortunately, I have another session. Well, that's mm -hmm. okay. Uh, did you have any other questions for us, Jim, or something we could chat about? Um, I'm still coming back down, so... I will let, leave the questions to you. <laughs> okay. Very good. And Max, you, you said you had many questions that uh, you wanted to, questions. Yeah. to pass on. So. Yeah, uh, I guess the question was about Elohim. But do you have any connections to Elohim? Elohim? Uh, Elena? Oh, well, I don't. I have the I have a connection to the L, which is um, ancestors of the ancient builder race. Okay. Uh -huh. And they're very. They have a few different species in there as well. They have Arcturians. They have Pleiadians. They have a mixture of different species, pure Andromedan and pure Palladian, or mixture of Andromedan and Palladian. And they call themselves the the descendants or the ancestors of of the ancient builder race. So they're not the pure ancient builder race, but they are their descendants. Wonderful. And, yeah. How do they look? Do they have a special physical appearance? They're very tall, 10 feet, 20 feet, and ranging up to all the way to 82 feet or even 100 feet. Wow, that's huge. Yeah. And their ship is, it has different accommodations. They have 2,000 plus crew. And every level is um, specially designed to accommodate the, the combination of the descendant species that are there on the ship together. So different huh. environmental accommodation on the ship. The Akishan is called the Akishan. Wow, um, cool. What, yeah. the, what is the mission of that ship? Uh, it is exploration, it is observation, and it is to help with the ascension process. They actually have... Um, they call us the light keys. They have six of us here on the planet. So I have some kind of energetic connection with the Akashan ship. It came 13,000 years from the future back here to, to make sure everything goes smoothly for us as we ascend. So they're yeah. still here. I mentioned earlier that I thought you were here to hold light so, mm -hmm. and energy for the planet. So I guess that was pretty close. Yes, I think so too. Uh, they call us the light keys. So, excellent, cool. Yeah, that's the connection I have to the L. I, I'm not sure if it's the Elohim or not, but that's. There's several different L's. There's seven seven different kinds of L continuums or communities. So there's El Yaha and Elohim and L, and there's other ones that I don't even know their names of, but I know I was told there's seven. Okay. But they're not around this area yet. Mm -hmm. Today was a certain download. My friend uh, Lucia, she is um, downloading a lot of new codes and information and uh, solutions for the humanity. But 
I was, I guess, an antenna for that download. I wasn't consciously doing that. I was just part of the meditation. But when I was there present, I contributed certain, I guess, transmission to that download, which was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, very cool. So you don't, have, you don't necessarily have to be aware of your, the codes you can bring, but you can just be a, a, a channel which helps to bring certain codes, download certain codes. And I think that's what Jim does when he channels. He brings in certain codes and answers for us through, through his ET connections because it's, it's like I had some info on the Anunnaki. I energetically felt like they weren't just one species, but mm -hmm. and to care had the information mm -hmm. to, to describe what they were, more mm -hmm. detail. So it's, it's, it's energetic codes coming down through her, through Jim. Cool. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It was wonderful to be here today with you. I always enjoy your company, both of you. Well, thank you. thank you very much. And I'm going to have to bow out so I can prepare for my next mm -hmm. uh, next thing. Yep. So have a wonderful evening. I love you guys very much. And I will talk to you again very soon, I'm sure. Yes. Have a good night, Jim. Uh, you have this session... Oh, you don't have, so Jim, are you skipping the next Saturday? Are you doing the next Saturday webinar? Yes, I am. You are doing next Saturday webinar, that helps. Yes, I am. And after that, you don't or you don't know? I'm not sure yet, but I, I am doing the next one. Perfect. All right, April, thank you. April All 1st. right, see you later. Is there anything we can discuss or there talk is about? Tons more. Um, I'm running out of energy. Let's do it short, but. Um, sure. Let's maybe talk about Russia and uh, the Europe and the, the, the mystical course of history. Sure. What is the role of different countries and how things are developing? Do you have any insights into that? Well, there's different uh, stargates and portals in every country. Mm -hmm. So the energy vibration is different everywhere. And I think Russia, for example, is, is a country that wants the truth to come out. Absolutely, yes. The Not leaders. everybody, but there is a certain fraction of population which are truth seekers, absolutely. Very passionate, yes. Because Russia has had a few revolutions. It had the perestroika in it, and that's energetically all connected to things and to people. Mm -hmm. That Russia has always wanted a better quality of life. So they've, they've always thought, sought that energetically. And that's reflected into, into how they are as a culture that wants freedom. Yeah, there is so much restrictions even now that people are so eager to get freedom. I mean, if you don't seek freedom, you basically, you can survive there. Yeah, yeah. And I came from there just when the perestroika was happening. That's when I mm -hmm. left as a kid. So I remember there wasn't any money. People were lining up to buy bread and to buy chicken and stuff. And that's the only thing that you could buy. And you just... But people were still nice. People were still, you know, nice to you. And if you didn't have the bread, they'd give you a bit of bread. Really? Yes, that's what my, my dad, you know, he, he couldn't go to the bank and exchange the money. So his friends helped him out too. Oh. You know, they had money, so they exchanged it with him. So he could leave the country. So there, there was still a solidarity between neighbors, which I'm... I don't know if that's in Canada or the U.S. Neighbors would help neighbors out. How, if there was a crisis, would would everybody help each other out? There is lots of nice people, lots of nice people, lots of compassionate people. But that's again, good. there is lots of angry people too. Yeah. So it's it's a mixture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are some people who are givers for sure and carers. Mm -hmm. But the culture, yeah, the culture is there is certain specifics. Um, yeah, like, you know, there is, in Chicago, there is so many homeless people on the street. And it is like, you can see it every day. And 
Some of them are just new. Some of them like a professional homeless, right? And some mm -hmm. of them just stepped out because they're desperate. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, you know, it's, it's so sick when there is people spending money on nothing, right? On useless things and wasting energy on useless things. And there are people like homeless people in the street that doesn't make any sense together, right? Mm -hmm. That is sick. There's so much sick here, right? On Earth. Yeah, right. There's, there's no energetical balance. Um, the social structure, you know, if a person can't work for some reason anymore and if they can't get the medical tests and, to prove why, they end up homeless. You know, if they don't have the understanding, okay, well, I'm now disabled. I, I can't work because something is wrong with me. If they can't even get access to a doctor and medical help just to diagnose that they they have no support system no structure for anybody to help them with this so they let's give people some hope so yes, what do we do exactly let's give people some hope um yes what do you do um first realize that death is not the end of the world right you don't no. you shouldn't be afraid of death it's a liberation and return home second it is um if there's a lesson which you learn anyway as you die and you take it to another incarnation. So nothing is lost, nothing is lost. Even the worst thing, like the wars and suffering, it is nothing is lost. No. The, the fear of death is part of the conspiracy. Mm -hmm. The fear of death, the fear of sickness is part of the conspiracy. And you are, if you are afraid and angry, it's part of your mind control. You shouldn't. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be afraid and angry. You keep breathing. And there is like that beautiful movie. It's called Collateral Beauty. And then you wake. Just look around. Even at the worst times, even at the worst times in Russia, there was still beauty around. Yes. There was still, still a chance, right? There is mm -hmm. a, still a chance. There is still an option. And sometimes you're locked like... I don't have money, I don't have that, I don't have that. But there is so many options around, like one of them, go help someone else. Yeah. And it is very likely that next door neighbor is also desperate, but they have what you need and you can yes. give them what they need. Yes. Because the biggest sickness in the Western world is loneliness. Yes. Like people live in huge houses. Like we live like in two bedroom apartment, there is, four of us plus two dogs. <laughs> we, have, we have separators with, with uh, curtains. So mm -hmm. with, like in the living room, there is someone living behind the curtains and we have to talk quietly so to let them sleep. So, you know, yeah. but in Russia and in big cities, it's like that. But most of America, Canada, you have huge houses and there yes. is no one else. And there are homeless people nearby, right? It mm -hmm. doesn't make a lot of sense. It's, it's, so there are options. Mm -hmm. and also you don't need much food right i do i do i don't but some people okay my friends you know they switch to light and they can live in light and uh, eat almost nothing i wish i could do that i i tried so far it didn't work for me i have to eat food and got high quality food but but you don't have to be hurrying and uh, working through through that system of fear yeah, yeah they, they make you be afraid and do something which makes no sense that's what and, i'm saying and if you you know if if you buy food and you have leftovers give it to a soup kitchen give it to a homeless person give it to animals that live outside you know if it's hard winter we gave we had bread and stuff leftover um stuff and my mom fed it to the crows or to the raccoons you know if you have it and if you're not eating it and if the food is still decent quality, like I said, give it to the soup kitchen, give it to a homeless person if they'll, if they'll accept it, right? And share, share if you have extras, share it. If you have extra clothing that you don't need anymore and that's still decent, donate it to a shelter. Um, donate it to the Salvation Army as well because they, they sell clothing for, you know, for less than what it is on retail. So somebody, if they're in need, they'll buy it. 
Uh, I heard, uh, I will listen now a book about gurus by Ram Das. Uh, he has all the wonderful gurus, including his favorite Maharaji. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the gurus, his tradition was, he was very poor. I mean, he was lived, he lived on donations and he would cook for two, two pancakes, I guess, from whatever, I guess, lentil pancakes or something like that. He would cut in four pieces. One he would give to birds. It's a symbol of air element. One he will give to cow, symbol of um, mammals. I don't know what element it would be. And one he would give to fishes, to fish. And he would just eat the half of the pancake himself. Uh, I, I never thought about that as, as a ritual, but basically you have to support all elements of the, of, of, of the life on earth. Yes, and, and try to help each other. Like you said, if one neighbor has something and the other one has something else, they could do a fair exchange to help each other out in time of need or just if you need to help others, that's what you'll do. And it, it, and it goes a long way. And even if you're helpless, like you're homeless and you, unforeseen circumstances happen to you, there are some nice people who will give money as donation, who will give a bit of food, clothing to help those people who are homeless. And the government structure does not really support those people, but sometimes uh, there's homeless shelters. You could go to a place. Yeah, churches. Churches, exactly. So there, there's ways to, to not stay out on the street. I came to America and uh, I got in a situation when I, I, my English was pretty bad. I had two children and uh, a wife, two small children. I think they were like six and eight or maybe five, five, and, five and seven. And we ran out of money soon. I had salary coming, but at a certain moment I was desperate because there was no money, there was no way to get to work, right? So mm -hmm. I went, I walked to the synagogue. They didn't give, give me a physical help at the moment. I don't, don't think, this one was pretty poor synagogue. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they started speaking to you and the fact that you can cross that barrier for me that asking a foreigner, like in English, they won't speak Russian, right? Asking someone for help. I came here, I need help. They would speak to you kindly. That by itself was a positive thing. It kind of was a step. And then I asked people around and finally somebody landed me uh, $2,000 so I could buy a car and then I could go to work and earn money. Mm -hmm. But uh, for, for many, that step of asking for help is most crucial. And yeah. not many people are ready for that they would think it is they would think it is shameless shameful mm -hmm. and it's not yeah. asking for help should be normal you i started a community here in san diego uh self-help network so we have a community of people here and we help we, we, we meet and uh, we help people to find um, friends mm -hmm. and also people share their uh, need for to find jobs. So, we, I mean, there is a whole network of people who help each other find jobs. And there is also a network of people who help on different interests, like there is a Russian network and there is also alternative healers network where they help each other to establish themselves as healers and build their own business because mm -hmm. many healers don't have any business skills. And yeah. some people have tons of business skills, but they can help others to, to, to mm -hmm. okay, set it up. Exactly. And when I came here with my parents, we didn't know any English and we didn't have much money either. And the Jewish community helped us with furniture. Uh, they had a net network like, okay, if you don't have any furniture and you just moved into the apartment, you don't know English. They provided us with furniture, with basic, you know, used couch, used desks, used beds, even used TVs. And that helped us just, you know, just to live because we didn't have much money to buy furniture. All right, and it doesn't have to be your national community. There no. could be great many churches and communities like you can knock on many doors. Like if you can knock on the doors by religious principle, by any other principle. There are yeah. lots of people who love to help. I, 
Exactly. I, I love to help. And I have friends who, whose main mission here is just to help others, right? They, yes. They would find a way to help. They exactly. Would find, you know, it's the, the issue of asking for help. Yeah. Um, another topic I wanted to bring up, I, I just discovered in Russia a, a network it's, it's very structured. It's more like a, a new build, built church. It's called Philosophy of Synthesis. Um, and they're very advanced in terms of understanding their, the metaphysics. So they build their, it's, it's best, maybe it's as best to describe them as followers of Blavatsky theosophists, but uh, the when, you know, Blavatsky was 120 years ago. Now it's, it is, way more advanced. They understand aliens really well. Mm -hmm. They channel, they have uh, spiritual guidance. Uh, they have their leader, spiritual leader is, let me translate, um, teacher Kudhumi, 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 teacher Kudhumi, or father Kudhumi, mm -hmm. uh, who is a Pythagoras in one of the past lives. So they are Pythagoreans in one, one of the ways. And, um, and they are very structured. They have pretty good hierarchy and they're expanding. They're now spilled to California. So they teach here and I started going to their webinars, so seminars, physical seminars. It's a paid seminar. This $240 plus for a two day seminar. But, but I haven't met any other teaching which is that advanced metaphysically. Mm. So I'm very interested. It's what, what is unique to them, they don't only teach the, the theory, they do a lot of collective, individual, synchronized and unsynchronized meditations where they do spiritual ascension work. So that's the main mission, spiritual. We do that, but we do it in, a, how they say, uh, in organized fashion, as, as unorganized as possible. We are like mm -hmm. uh, a crowd of people who just came together. And I was surprised to find a system where they have hierarchy assignments and people just choose their assignments. They say, I'm good with like some good with stones, mm -hmm. uh, portals and uh, something else. I don't know what else. Yeah. Uh, and you know what I'm good. I, I, I do chanting, right? And mm -hmm. um, teaching and stuff, right? Yeah. So, and we've been, and I like micro microphones. That's, that's my, I like microphones. So, so they meditate on their topic, trying, trying to lift it up and they do lift it up. So actually they work on lifting up certain ascension things. So that's the first time it is pu publicized on, in English, because so far they were working only in Russia. They just came to America in terms of a teaching. There are individuals who came here, but now they kind of come together and are working here. And it is not a secret organization. It, they, they, publish, they, they publish their everything. Their leader is very public. They are, um, interestingly, they are anti-religious. <laughs> They're sort of a sect, but they uh, separate themselves from religious people. Mm -hmm for many reasons, because their knowledge is more like, more like, you know, new way, new way, new age, new age, and new age is not very well compatible with old religions, especially with dominant mm -hmm. ones. Yeah, so they're true. pretty, pretty, they're pretty secular. They, you know, the people wear secular things. They're like doing their teaching. So the two, two things, they do two things, teach and individual meditation work. Do you have any comments or questions or anything on that topic? Well, I've recently learned about Nikolai Levashev material. Have you I ever don't heard? know. Nikolai Levashev? Yeah, he was a um, Russian healer. He could heal just by energy. He could scan your body and mm -hmm. he could tell you what the issue was, the, the, the syndrome, the disease, whatever, and he could just take it away. He just take it away and he could also teach you, you know, about the body, about the laws of nature. He, he also had 
his mind uniquely worked that he he could astral travel and physically also go to other planets and meet ETs and stuff. And his students, he he taught you all of that stuff, but he also recalibrated your brain frequency patterns so you could do the same stuff as him. I want uh, my health problems to be taken away. I have, yeah. I have food poisoning from anything. I eat food and then I'm sick from any food. So I want to be able to digest human food. Mm-hmm. So he could literally just energetically look at somebody. He was like a medical intuitive doctor and he could just take it away. He could just balance everything out and it would be good. And it came from Russia. He has a whole community in Russia still who does that. Wow. He wrote books in Russian and it was translated into English. So some of his books, if you Google uh, Nikolai Levashev, okay. you'll, you'll find his books for free to download. Some of them were translated. Yeah, everything in Russia can be pirated and uh, no, nobody no. would and consider it. Was, it. Yeah. No, it wasn't pirated. He had somebody, he was working with somebody, Levashev was working with Elena something and she translated his material from okay. Russian to English and it's posted on their website. All right, so it was donated to public, all right. Yeah, it was donated freely and so people are still studying his material and his his work has survived and been passed on to new students. He, he gave his legacy of the books for free. So there, he was one of those people that believed you pass it on for others. Yeah, I found Nikolai Levashov on Wikipedia. It's easy yes. to find. Yes. So he was... Right, I, will, I will study that. I just finished reading uh, a book on Gurdjieff. Actually, several books on Gurdjieff. He was interesting. You know, Gurdjieff is one of contemporaries of, I guess, Stalin and Lenin. And um, he knew Blavatsky and he was one of New Agers. Mm. He was teaching everywhere, but uh, his main base was in France. And he went to America with uh, concerts of uh, spiritual dancing. He learned uh, his main skills from uh, uh, India, Tibet, Tibet area. And uh, he brought it to the West and taught basically new age philosophy to, to his students. And he had many famous, especially Europeans, writers and culture leaders, uh, celebrities, to study with him. Very interesting. He was like a guru, a guru placed in Paris. Mm. So all eras have their healers and teachers and in some form or other, this is information is always passed on to the, to the, to us somehow. All right. I think we're done. Mm Mm-hmm unless we have anything else. I just like to mention that nothing is ever lost information and knowledge. It's always there somewhere to access, to get downloaded. Like you were saying earlier, you get downloads. So stuff comes in through the universe to us as we need it. And then you take it to the, to the next life, all the skills you get. And some of the, I guess I have to share that. Like my mother was dying it was 1994 she died. So it was now 22 years, I guess, 23 years. Um, she started as a, she grew up in Soviet Union. So there was very little of God known, like very little of spirituality. There was communist, communist spirituality, but it was very unspiritual, I would say. There was some myths and beliefs, but they, it was very far from, true spirituality because there was no God there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, gradually she she became interested in religion and she asked me where she should go like Jewish or Russian religion. She was born Jewish like from Jewish family and uh, I said there is no ra- Jewish religion around. It wasn't at that time in 1990. It wasn't around in Soviet Union. But Russian, Russian religion was there. So I said, go with Russian. It doesn't really matter what you choose. It's the same God, whatever door is available, go through that door. So mm-hmm. 
So this four years around 1990 to 1994, she became enlightened and she died of cancer. But last few days, I would say, it was a major upgrade and after upgrade, after upgrade, I was with her. She died enlightened. She died very, her body was, she became, last say few months, she became older, like from looking like 60, she became, she died looking like 19. Maybe in last month she did she did like a year in a week or something. She was mm -hmm. aging very fast, but I think now I realize her spiritual upgrade was fast. So the time was just accelerated. So she made it in a very short period of time. So nothing is wasted. Nothing mm -hmm. wasted. It's it is the spiritual upgrade which matters. Yes. And the body is just you know whatever you used to learn lessons and yes and exactly. Um, that is just helps you to deal with death and sickness. It's not that you want it, but when you have it, you it helps you to deal like like animals. They don't want to die. They are still afraid of pain and death, but but they don't mourn as much. I would say in most yeah. cases they uh, take it easy. They take it. They respect. Like my dogs recently came to a dying squirrel. Mm -hmm. And I think they didn't want to hunt it. And they just kind of sent her energy. I think they were friendly with her. They kind of poked at it, like, why don't you just stand up and go? Um, so there is certain, and, and, and aborigin, aboriginal cultures, they're, they're afraid of lots of things, but they don't, they don't live their life afraid of death. That's, that's no. the main thing. Many cultures... Non, non westernized culture no, don't live their life to survive they live their life for some other reasons but not to not to die yeah they're not afraid of passing on because it's a teaching tool what they they learn here they take elsewhere and it just goes on and on and it's a circle of life and life even exists beyond death the soul give, goes on do you go? Do you do any galactic languages? Can you do a blessing in a galactic language? Yes, I can. Arach, arach na matna achtu arushna arashia hakwa asinata anahwa akiyashta arachtana ana yakwa. Yeah, na ana oh my God, I yakusha I ana ama ala ha oh ra I ana am 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 ama ala 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 ukaya ala 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 ukaya ana ala am 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 oh ana oh am ana 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 oh Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Спасибо за вебинар. На этом я заканчиваю запись. Спасибо большое, Макс. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.